Thank you for joining Wars of the Roses. As we continue with Chapter 7, the Rosicrucians, their rules, aims, and method of working, from Francis Bacon and his Secret Society, by Mrs. Henry Pott. Chapter 7, the Rosicrucians, their rules, aims, and method of working. Work when God works, promise. To see how God in all his creatures works, 2 Henry 6. Ripening would seem to be the proper work of the sun, which operates by gentle action through long spaces of time, whereas the operations of fire, urged on by the impatience of man, are made to hasten their work. Nova Morganum. Brief and incomplete as are the previous chapters, it is hoped that they may serve their purpose of unsettling the minds of those who suppose that the history, character, aims, and work of Bacon are thoroughly understood and that all is known that is ever likely to be known concerning him. The discrepancies of opinion, the tremendous gaps in parts of the story, the unexpected facts which persistent research and collation of passages have continued to unearth, the vast amount of matter of every description which, unless philology be an empty word and the study of it froth and vanity, must in future years be ascribed to Bacon, are such as to force the explorer to pause and seriously to ask himself, are these things possible? Could any one man, however gigantic his powers, however long his literary life, have produced all the works which we are forced by evidence, internal and sometimes also external, to believe Bacon's, his in conception, in substance, in diction, even though often apparently paraphrased, interpolated or altered by other hands? The mind of the inquirer turns readily toward the history of the great secret societies which were formed during the Middle Ages, and which became, in troublous times of church or state, such tremendous engines for good and evil. A consequent study of these secret societies, their true origin, their aims, and so far as they can be traced, their leaders, agents, and organs, renders it evident that although single-handed, such self-imposed labors as Bacon proposed and undertook would be manifestly impracticable, yet, with the aid of such an organization as that of the Rosicrucian fraternity, the thing could be done for this society, whether in its principles, its objects, its proceedings, or in the very obscurity and mystery which surrounds it, is of all others the one best calculated to promote Bacon's aims, its very constitution seeming to be the result of his own scheme and method. So much interest has lately been roused on the subject of the Rosicrucians that we shall curtail our own observations as much as possible trusting that readers will procure the books which in these later days have made the study of this formerly obscure and difficult subject so pleasant and easy? Is it still needful to say that the Rosicrucians were certainly not, as has been thought, atheists or infidels, alchemists or sorcerers? So far as we could find when investigating this subject some years ago and as seems to be fully confirmed by the recent researches of others, there is no real ground for believing that the society was an ancient one, or that it existed before 1575, or that it issued any publication in its own name before 1580. All the legends concerning the supposititious monk Christian Rosenkreuz, and the still more shadowy stories which pretend that the Rosy Cross brethren traced their origin to remote antiquity, and to the Indians or Egyptians melt into thin air, and like the baseless fabric of a vision, dissolve away when we approach them with spectacles on nose and pen in hand. A halo of poetic splendor surrounds the order of the Rosicrucians. The magic lights of fancy play round their graceful daydreams, while the mystery in which they shrouded themselves lends additional attraction to their history. But their brilliancy was that of a meteor. It just flashed across the realms of imagination and intellect and vanished forever. Not, however, without leaving behind some permanent and lovely traces of its hasty passage. Poetry and romance are deeply indebted to the Rosicrucians for many a fascinating creation. The literature of every European country contains hundreds of pleasing fictions whose machinery has been borrowed from their system of philosophy, though that itself has passed away. As will be seen, there is strong reason to doubt whether the words which we have rendered in italics are correct. The philosophy the work of the Rosy Cross Brethren has never passed away. It is, we feel sure, still green and growing and possessing all the earth. It is only just to readers to whom this subject is new to say that there is still a wide divergence of opinion concerning the origin and true aims of the secret society of the Rosicrucians. 
Bailey gives the following account. Their chief was a German gentleman educated in a monastery where having learned the languages, he traveled to the Holy Land, anno 1378, and being at Damascus and falling sick, he had heard the conversation of some Arabs and other Oriental philosophers by whom he is supposed to have been initiated into this mysterious art. At his return into Germany, he formed a society and communicated to them the secrets he had brought with him out of the East and died in 1484. They were a sect or cabal of hermetical philosophers who bound themselves by a solemn secret which they swore inviolably to observe and obliged themselves at their admission into the order to a strict observance of certain established rules. They pretended to know all sciences and especially medicine of which they published themselves the restorers. They also pretended to be masters of abundance of important secrets and among others that of the philosopher's stone, all which they affirmed they had received by tradition from the ancient Egyptians, Chaldeans, the Magi, and Gymnosophists. They pretended to protract the period of human life by means of certain nostrums, and even to restore youth. They pretended to know all things. They are also called the Invisible Brothers because they have made no appearance, but have kept themselves incog for several years. As will be seen, we cannot agree with the opinions of Bailey and others who have claimed for the society a very great antiquity, finding no evidence whatever that the hermetical philosophers last described, the supposed alchemists and sorcerers, were ever heard of until the end of the 16th century. That a secret religious society did exist for mutual protection amongst the Christians of the early church and all through the darkest ages until the stormy times of persecution at the Reformation and Counter-Reformation, there can be no doubt. Probably the rude and imperfect organization of the early religious society was taken as a basis on which to rear the complete and highly finished edifice as we find it in the time of James I. But in honest truth, all statements regarding Rosicrucians as a society of men of letters existing before the year 1575 must be regarded as highly doubtful, and the stories of the Rosicrucians themselves as fictions or parabolical feigned histories devised in order to puzzle and astonish the uninitiated hearer. In the Royal Masonic Cyclopedia, there is an article on the Rosicrucians, which seems in no way to run counter to these opinions. The article begins with the statement that in times long ago there existed men of various races, religions and climes who bound themselves by solemn obligations of mutual succor, of impenetrable secrecy and of humility to labor for the preservation of human life by the exercise of the healing art. But no date is assigned for the first appearance of this society in any form or under any name. And the title Rosicrucian was, we know, never given or adopted until after the publication of The Chemical Marriage of Christian Rosenkreutz in 1616. The writer in the Cyclopedia seems to acknowledge that the truth about the origin of the Rosicrucian fraternity is known, though known only to a few, and we have strong reasons for believing that in Germany at least, a certain select number of the learned members of the Catholic, not the Papal Church, are fully aware of how, when and where this society was formed, which after a while assumed the name of Rosicrucian, but which the initiates in Germany call by its true name, Baconian. It is very difficult in all Masonic writings for the uninitiated to sift the true from the false, or rather fact from disguised history, prosaic statements from figurative language, a genuine information from garbled statements framed expressly to mislead. Yet in spite of these things, which must never be lost sight of, the article in question gives such a good summary of some of the chief facts and theories about the Rosy Cross Brethren that for the benefit of those who cannot easily procure the Cyclopedia, we transcribe some portions. Men of the most opposite worldly creeds, of diverse habits and even of apparently remote ideas have ever joined together consciously or unconsciously to glorify the good and despise, although with pity, the evil that might be reconciled to the good. But in the centuries of unrest which accompanied the evolution of any kind of civilization, either ancient or modern, how was this laudable principle to be maintained? This was done by a body of the learned, existing in all ages under peculiar restrictions, and at one time known as the Rosicrucian Fraternity. 
The Fraternity of the Rosy Cross, unlike the lower orders of Freemasons, seldom had gatherings together. The brethren were isolated from each other, although aware of their mutual existence and corresponding by secret and mysterious writings and books after the introduction of printing. They courted solitude and obscurity and sought in the contemplation of the divine qualities of the Creator that beatitude which the rude outside world despised or feared. In this manner, however, they also became the discoverers and conservators of important physical secrets, which, by slow degrees, they gradually communicated to the world with which, in another sense, they had so little to do. It is not at the same time to be supposed that these occult philosophers either despise the pleasures or discourage the pursuits of their active contemporaries. But, as we ever find some innermost sanctuary in each noble and sacred fane, so they retired to constitute a body apart, and more peculiarly devoted to those mystical studies for which the great mass of mankind were unfitted by taste or character. Mildness and beneficence marked such courteous intercourse as their studious habits permitted them to have with their fellow men. And in times of danger, in centuries of great physical suffering, they emerged from their retreats with the benevolent object of vanquishing and alleviating the calamities of mankind. In a rude period of turmoil, of battle, and of political change, they placidly pursued their way, the custodians of human learning, and thus acquired the respect and even the reverence of their less cultivated contemporaries. The very fact of their limited number led to their further elevation in the public esteem, and there grew up around them somewhat of the divinity that doth hedge a king. It is easy at the present day to see that which is held up before everyone in the broad light of a tolerant century, but it was not so in the days of the Rosicrucians and other fraternities. There was a dread amongst the masses of society in bygone days of the unseen, a dread as recent events and phenomena show very clearly, not yet overcome in its entirety. Hence, students of nature and mind were forced into an obscurity not altogether unwelcome or irksome, but in this obscurity they paved the way for a vast revolution in mental science. The patient labors of Trittenheim produced the modern system of diplomatic cipher writing. Even the apparently aimless wanderings of the monks and friars were associated with practical life, and the numerous missals and books of prayer carried from camp to camp conveyed to the initiated secret messages and intelligence dangerous to be communicated in other ways. The sphere of human intelligence was thus enlarged and the freedom of mankind from a pitiless priesthood, or perhaps rather a system of tyranny under which that priesthood equally suffered, was ensured. It was a fact not even disputed by Roman Catholic writers of the most papal ideas that the evils of society, ecclesiastical and lay, were materially increased by the growing worldliness of each successive pontiff. Hence we may see why the origin of Rosicrucianism was veiled by symbols and even its founder, Andrea, was not the only philosophical romancer. Plato, Apuleius, Heliodorus, Lucian, and others had preceded him in this path. It is worthy of remark that one particular century, and that in which the Rosicrucians first showed themselves, is distinguished in history as the era in which most of these efforts at throwing off the trammels of the past occurred. Hence the opposition of the losing party and their virulence against anything mysterious or unknown. They freely organized pseudo-Rosicrucian and Masonic societies in return, and these societies were instructed to irregularly entrap the weaker brethren of the true and invisible order, and then triumphantly betray anything they might be so inconsiderate as to communicate to the superiors of these transitory and unmeaning associations. Modern times have eagerly accepted, in the full light of science, the precious inheritance of knowledge bequeathed by the Rosicrucians and that body has disappeared from the visible knowledge of mankind and re-entered that invisible fraternity of which mention was made in the opening of this article. It is not desirable in a work of this kind to make disclosures of an indiscreet nature. The Brethren of the Rosy Cross will never and should not at peril and under alarm give up their secrets. This ancient body has apparently disappeared from the field of human activity, but its labors are being carried on with alacrity and with a sure delight in an ultimate success. Although 
During our search for information, experience has made us increasingly cautious about believing anything which we read in printed books concerning the Rosicrucians or the Freemasons. Still, it seems almost impossible to discredit the statements which have just been quoted. At least it will be granted that the writer is intending to tell the truth. He seems also to speak with knowledge, if not with authority. And such a passage as has been last quoted must, we think, shake the opinion of those who would maintain that the Rosicrucians, if ever they really existed and worked for any good purpose, have certainly disappeared, and that there is no such secret organization at the present time. The facts of the case, so far as we have been able to trace them, are entirely in accordance with the assertion that the non-existence of the Rosicrucian society is only apparent. True, they work quietly and unrecognized, but their labors are unremitting, and the beneficial results patent in our very midst. A great light has been shed upon our subject by the publication in 1887 of Mr. Waite's remarkable little book, which has for the first time laid before the public several tracts and manuscripts whose existence, if known to previous investigators, had certainly been ignored, including different copies and accounts of the universal reformation of the whole wide world, the title of one of the chief Rosicrucian documents, as well as original editions of the chemical marriage of Christian Rosy Cross, which are not in the library catalogue. It is true, as Mr. Waite says, that he is thus enabled to offer for the first time in the literature of the subject, the Rosicrucians represented by themselves. This invaluable book should be read in connection with another important volume which has since been published and which follows the subject into recesses whither it is impossible now to attempt to penetrate. Mr. Wigston enters boldly and learnedly upon the connection perceivable between Bacon's philosophy and Rosicrucianism. And the whole book goes to prove, on very substantial grounds, that Bacon was probably the founder and certainly the mainstay of the society. For those who have not the time or opportunity for much reading, it may be well again briefly to summarize the aims of the Rosicrucians as shown by their professed publications and the rules and system of work by which they hoped to secure those aims. We gather from the evidence collected that the objects of the fraternity were threefold. One, to purify religion and to stimulate reform in the church. Two, to promote and advance learning and science. Three, to mitigate the miseries of humanity and to restore man to the original state of purity and happiness from which by sin he has fallen. On comparing the utterances of the supposed authors of the Rosicrucian manifestos with Bacon's reiterated statements as to his own views and aspirations, we find them to be identical in thought and sentiment, sometimes identical in expression. It is only necessary to refer to the eloquent and beautiful chapter with which Spedding opens his Letters and Life of Bacon, and from which some portions have been already quoted, in order to perceive how striking is the general resemblance in aim how early the aspirations of Bacon formed themselves into a project, and with what rapidity the project became a great fact. Assuming then, concludes the biographer, that a deep interest in these three causes, the cause of reformed religion of his native country and of the human race through all their generations, was thus early implanted in that vigorous and virgin soil, we must leave it to struggle up as it may, according to the accidents of time and weather. Of Bacon's life I am persuaded that no man will ever form a correct idea, unless he bear in mind that from very early youth his heart was divided by these three objects, distinct but not discordant. Bacon, as we have seen, was not fifteen years old when he conceived the thought of founding a new system for the advancement of knowledge and for the benefit of humanity. The Rosicrucian manifestos inform us that the founder of the society and the writer of one of the most important documents, the chemical marriage, was a boy of 15. Mr. Waite observes naturally enough that the knowledge evinced by the writer of the paper in question of the practices and purposes of alchemy must be impossible to the most precocious boy. But in mine, Francis Bacon never was a boy. Some men, he said, were always boys. Their minds never grew with their bodies. But he reflected, evidently thinking of himself in relation to others, that all is not in years, somewhat also is in hours well spent. Never had he been idle truant, omitting the sweet benefit of time, but rather had, like Proteus, for that's his name, 
made use and fair advantage of his days, his years but young, but his experience old, his head unmellowed, but his judgment ripe. Wonderful as it is, improbable as it would appear, did we not know it to be the case, the fact remains, that at the age of 15, Francis Bacon had run through the whole round of the arts and sciences at Cambridge, had outstripped his tutors, and had left Cambridge in disappointment and disgust, finding nothing more to learn there. He did not wait to pass a degree, but practically it was acknowledged that he had more than deserved it, for the degree of Master of Arts was conferred upon him some time afterward. How he spent the next year is not recorded by his biographer, but another R.C. document, the Fama Fraternitatis, throws a sidelight upon the matter. In this paper, full as all these Rosicrucian manifestos are of Bacon's ideas and peculiarities of expression, we read that the high and noble spirit of one of the fraternity was stirred up to enter into the scheme for a general reformation and to travel away to the wise men of Arabia. This we interpret to mean that at this time the young philosopher was entering his studies of Rasis, of Enzor, Averroes, Avicenna and other Arabic physicians and hermetic writers, from whom we find him quoting in his acknowledged as well as in his unacknowledged writings. At this time, the famer informs us, this young member was 16 years old, and for one year he had pursued his course alone. What is this likely to mean but that, having left college, he was pursuing his advanced studies by himself? It seems almost a certainty that at this period he was endeavouring, as so many other ardent minds have done, to get at a knowledge of the first causes of things. How could he better attempt to achieve this than by going back to the most ancient philosophies in order to trace the history of learning and thought from the earliest recorded period to his own times? We shall presently have occasion to show the immense influence which the study of the occult philosophies of India, Persia, Arabia and Egypt had upon the mind and writings of Francis Bacon, and how he drew from them the most elementary and universal symbols and emblems which are the foundations of Freemason language and hieroglyphics. But there is another particular which especially links Bacon with the whole system of Rosicrucianism, and this is that very matter of making collections or dictionaries which we spoke of in the last chapter. Now this was not only one of the ostensible objects of the fraternity, but also the ostensible object of Francis Bacon. He claims the idea as his own and declares that neither Aristotle nor Theophrastus, Dioscorides or Pliny, and much less any of the modern writers, have hitherto proposed such a thing to themselves. Spedding says Bacon would have found that such a dictionary or index of nature as he contemplated in the Novum Organum must be nearly as voluminous as nature herself, and he gives the impression that such a dictionary was not attempted by Bacon. Here, as will be seen, we differ from this admirable biographer and believe that Bacon did organize and himself commence such a system of note-taking, alphabetizing, collating, transporting, etc. As by the help of his 20 young gentlemen, his able pens, devoted friends in every corner of the civilized world, and especially from the Illuminati, Rosy Cross brethren, and skilled Freemasons to produce within a few years that truly cyclopedian mass of books of reference which later writers have merely digested or added to. Bacon claims as his own the method by which this great deficiency is to be supplied. Behold then the author of the Fama Fraternitatis making a precisely similar claim. After this manner began the fraternity of the Rosy Cross, first by four persons only, and by them was made the magical lanage and writing with a large dictionary. May not the sentence just quoted help somewhat to account for the extraordinary likeness, not only in ideas but in words of books, scientific and historical, which appeared before the publication of the great collections. Is it possible that copies or transcripts may have been made from Bacon's great manuscript dictionaries by those who would, with his ever ready help, proceed to make or produce a book? Were such budding authors, Rosicrucians, allowed to come under his roof to write their books and use his library and his brains? Questions at present unanswerable, but to be answered. Visions of Ben Jonson writing his Apology for Bartholomew Fair at the house of my Lord St. Albans, of Bacon visiting Raleigh in prison, of the young Hobbes pacing the alleys at Gorhambury with the Sage of Verulam. These and many other suggestive images rise and dissolve before the eyes of one who has tried to live in imagination the life of Francis Bacon, and to realize the way in which his faithful followers endeavored to fulfill his wishes. Dictionary is a dry, prosaic word to modern ears, the very idea 
of having to use one damps enthusiasm and drops us when several yards above the earth into the study or the classroom. But it so falls out that what we have we prize not to the worth whilst we enjoy it, but being lacked and lost, why then we rack the value? Now think, if we had no dictionaries, how we should lack them. And having made even one poor little notebook on any subject which closely concerns us, how we prize it and rack its value. So did Bacon. The making of dictionaries was to him a sacred duty, one of the first and most needful steps toward the accomplishment of his great ends. I want this primary history to be compiled with a religious care, as if every particular were stated on oath, seeing that is the book of God's works. And so far as the majesty of the heavenly may be compared with the humbleness of earthly things, a kind of second scripture. He sees that such a vast and difficult work is only to be accomplished by means of cooperation and by cooperation on a methodical plan. These convictions are most clearly seen in Bacon's most Rosicrucian works, the New Atlantis, Parasive, Natural and Experimental History and other fragmentary pieces. If, he says, all the wits of all ages which hitherto have been or hereafter shall be were clubbed together, if all mankind had given or should hereafter give their minds wholly to philosophy, and if the whole world were or should be composed of nothing but academies, colleges and schools of learned men, yet without such a natural and experimental history as we shall now prescribe, we deny that there could be or can be any progress in philosophy and other sciences worthy of mankind. The author of Pharma reflects in precisely the same fashion, writing the thought of the sacred nature of such a work, and the thought that it is a kind of second scripture, with that other most important reflection as to the necessity for unity and a combination of wits. If real progress is to be made and a book of nature or a perfect method of all arts be achieved, seeing the only wise and merciful God in these latter days hath poured so richly his mercy and goodness to mankind, whereby we do attain more and more to the knowledge of his Son, Jesus Christ, and of nature. He hath also made manifest unto us many wonderful and never heretofore seen works and creatures of nature, so that finally man might thereby understand his own nobleness and worth, and why he is called microcosmos, and how far his knowledge extendeth in nature. Although the rude world herewith will be but little pleased, but rather smile and scoff thereat. Also the pride and covetousness of the learned is so great, it will not suffer them to agree together. But were they united, they might, out of all those things which in this our age God doth so richly bestow upon us, collect librum nature, or a perfect method of all arts. The college of the six days which Bacon described is, we know, the college of the Rosicrucians who accept the new Atlantis in its old form as a Rosicrucian document, and allow it to be circulated under a changed title, the hopelessness and impossibility of attempting to perform single-handed all that his enthusiasm for humanity prompted, and that his prophetic soul foresaw for distant ages often oppressed his mind, and as often he summoned his energies, his philosophy and his faith in God to comfort and encourage him to the work. This is all very distinctly traceable in the Promus Notes, which are so frequently quoted in the Shakespeare plays. Amongst the early entries, in the sprawling Anglo-Saxon handwriting of his youth, he records his intention to use ingenuous honesty and yet with opposition and strength, good means against bad, horns to crosses. The ungodly, he next reflects, walk around on every side. I was silent from good words and my grief was renewed, but I believed and therefore have I spoken. And he is resolute in trying to do what he feels to be his duty, for the memory of the just lives with praise, but the name of the wicked shall rot. Here we find him registering his resolves to do good to others, regardless of private advantage or profit. This, it will be seen, is one of the cardinal rails of the Rosy Cross brethren. They were to cure the sick gratis, to seek for no pecuniary profit or reward for the works which they produced for the benefit of others. Buy the truth, say Bacon's notes, and sell it not. He who hasteth to be rich shall not be innocent, but give not that which is holy unto dogs. He foresaw or had already experienced in his own short life the manner in which the dogs or cynics of public opinion and of common ignorance would quarrel over and tear to pieces every scrap of new knowledge which he presented to them. The devil, he says farther on, hath cast a bone to set strife, but this should not hinder him. We ought to obey God rather than man, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. 
for we can do nothing against the truth, but much for the truth. And then he seems to prepare his mind to suffer on account of the efforts which he was making on mankind's behalf. He remembers that our blessed Lord himself suffered in the same way and writes a memorandum from this verse. Many good works have I showed you of my father. For which of those works do you stone me? Whatever might be the judgment upon him and his works, he would rest in the assurance of St. Paul. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. We hardly think that he stopped here in the quotation. Although he does not write down the other half of the passage, his ardent soul treasured and his works reflect in a thousand different ways the inspiring and triumphant hope of recognition in that future life to which he was always looking. Henceforward there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but to all that love his appearing. But meanwhile, how to do all that he felt and knew to be necessary, and yet which could only be done by himself, we see him again in the notes reflecting that victory can be gained by means of numbers, that things united are more powerful or better than things not united, that two eyes are better than one, so many heads, so many wits. Friends have all things in common. Many things taken together are helpful, which taken singly are of no use. One must take men as they are and times as they are. But on the whole, he seems to think that most men are serviceable for something, that every properly instructed tongue may be made to bear witness, and that it must be one part of his work to draw together so great a cloud of witnesses as may perform the part of a chorus endorsing, echoing, or capping the doctrines of the new philosophy as they were uttered, and giving a support as of public opinion both at home and abroad. We now know that many of Bacon's works were transmitted beyond the seas to France, Spain, Italy, Germany, and Holland, where they were translated and surreptitiously published, usually under other names than his own. There are, when we come to collect them, many indications in the promise of a secret to be kept and of a system planned for the keeping of it. The glory of God, we read, is to conceal a thing. And there are many secrets of God. Work as God works, quietly, persistently, secretly, unheeded, except by those who read in his infinite book of secrecy. Pluto's helmet is said to have produced invisibility. The gods have woolen feet, i.e. steal on us unawares. Triceps Mercurius, great runying, alludes perhaps to the little anonymous book of cipher called Mercury the Secret and Swift Messenger, which reproduces so accurately and without acknowledging him. Bacon's biliteral cipher and many other particulars told precisely after his manner that we believe it to be the brief summary by himself of some much larger works. But he also notes that a Mercury cannot be made of every word, that is a dull fellow will never he made a clever one. Nevertheless, a true servant may he made of an unlikely piece of wood, and he had a faculty for attaching people to him, and for bringing out all that was best and most serviceable in their natures. The next note says that princes have a cipher. Was he thinking that he, the prince of writers, would use one for his royal purposes? A few lines earlier is this entry. Is de militaris efficitur tragedia et comedia. Tragedies and comedies are made of one alphabet which we now know refers to the cipher narrative for which the password was the alphabet, and which is found running through the Shakespeare tragedies and comedies. Such entries as these, suggestive of some mystery, are interesting when taken in connection with other evidence derivable from Bacon's manuscript books, where the jottings have been more methodized or reduced from other notes. In the commentaries or transportata, which can be seen in manuscript at the British Museum, we find him maturing his plans for depreciating the philosophy of the Grecians with some better respect to ye Egyptians, Persians and Chaldees and the utmost antiquity and the mysteries of the poets. To consider what opinions are fit to nourish tanquam anse, so as to graft the new upon the old ut religion is solent of the ordinary core of incompetency of reason for natural philosophy and invention of works also of means to procure histories of all things natural and mechanical, lists of errors, observations, axioms, etc. Then follow entries from which we abridge, laying for a place to command Wits and Pennies, Westminster, Eton, Winchester, specially Trinity, Convert, Cam and St. John S. Cam, Magdalen Col, Oxford, Dirty Twins, of young scholars in ye universities. It must be the post-Nati 
giving pensions to four to compile the two histories, Utsupra. Foundy of a college for inventors, library, ingenery, qui, of the order and discipline, the rules and prescripts of their studies and inquiries, allowances for travailing intelligence and correspondence with ye universities abroad. Que of the mana and prescripts touching secrecy, traditions and publication. Here we have a complete sketch of the elaborate design which was to be worked out, and we wonder, yes, we wonder with an astonishment which increases as we approach the matter, how these remarkable jottings, so pregnant with suggestion, speaking to us in every line of a vast and deeply laid scheme, should have been so lightly, or can it be so purposely, passed over in every life or biography of Bacon. Here he was laying his plans to command wits and pens in all the great public schools, and especially in the principal colleges of the universities. He was endeavoring to secure the services of the cleverest scholars to assist him in working out a scheme of his own. They were especially to be young scholars who should have imbibed or who were capable of imbibing the advanced ideas produced by the new birth of time, which he had himself inaugurated. To work out new ideas, one must have fresh and supple material and minds belonging to bodies which have existed for nearly half a century are rarely either supple or easily receptive of new ideas. Bacon, therefore, did not choose for the main stuff and fiber of his great reforming society, men of his own age, he was now 47. He wisely sought out the brightest and freshest of the sons of the morning, the cream of youthful talent wherever it was to be discovered. Would it not be a pursuit as exciting as profitable to hunt out and track the footsteps of those choice young wits and pens of the new school of the temporis partus masculus and partis secundo delineatio, of which Bacon thought and wrote so much, and to see what various aids these young scholars were able to afford for his great work? One line of work is clearly indicated. They were under his own instructions to collect materials for compiling histories on natural philosophy and on inventions in the mechanical arts, as we should now say, the applied sciences. One work is specified as to its contents and nature. It is to be a history of Marvales with all the popular errors detected. Such a book was published shortly after Bacon's death by a young Oxford man of whom we shall by and by have occasion to speak. Another history is of mechanique. It is to be compiled with care and diligence and a school of science is to be established for the special study of the art of invention. A college furnished with all necessary scientific apparatus, workshops and materials for experiments. Not only so, but Bacon proposes to give pensions to four of his young men in order that they might freely devote themselves to scientific or philosophic research. Some were also to have allowances for traveling, which proves that their field of research and for the gleaning of materials was not to be confined only to their own country, but inquiries and correspondence with the universities abroad were to form an important element in the scheme. The works which were the product of this wise and liberal scheme of Bacon's will not be difficult of identification. They belong to the class of which the author said that they did not pretend to originality, but that they were flowers, culled from every man's garden and tied together by a thread of his own. It is clear that the wits and pens of the young scholars who, we learn from the Rosicrucian documents, were to be 63 in number, were chartered and secured under the seal of secrecy. The last of the manifestos in Mr. Waite's book contains this passage in which few who have read much of Bacon will fail to recognize his sentiments, his intentions, nay, his very words. I was 20 when this book was finished, but me thinks I have outlived myself. I begin to be weary of the sun. I've shaken hands with delight and know all is vanity, and I think no man can live well once but he that could live twice. For my part, I would not live over my hours past or begin again the minutes of my days, not because I have lived well, but for fear that I should live them worse. At my death, I mean to make a total adieu of the world, not caring for the burthen of a tombstone and epitaph. But in the universal register of God, I fix my contemplations on heaven. I writ the Rosicrucian infallible axiomata in four books and study not for my own sake only, but for theirs that study not for themselves. In the law, I began to be a perfect clerk, 
I writ the idea of the law, etc., for the benefit of my friends, and practice in King's Bench. I envy no man that knows more than myself, but pity them that know less. Now in the midst of all my endeavours, there is but one thought that dejects me, that my acquired parts must perish with myself, nor can be legacied amongst my dearly beloved and honoured friends. This is the very sentiment which caused Bacon to contrive some method of handing down by means of those very friends the lamp of tradition which he could not legacy, but which wherever forthcoming and by whomsoever rubbed, brings up on the spot the spirit of the lamp, Francis Bacon himself. Let us glance for a few minutes at the order and discipline, the rules and prescript, which were instituted for the use of the Rosicrucian fraternity, or may we not safely say for the use of Bacon's young scholars and friends? The original rules were 52 in number, but only the leading features of them can be noted, numbers being placed against them for the sake of brevity and reference. 1. The society was to consist of 63 members of various grades of initiation, apprentices, brethren, and an imperator. 2. These were all sworn to secrecy for a period of 100 years. 3. They were to have secret names, but to pass in public by their own names. 4. To wear the dress of the country in which they resided. 5. To profess ignorance if interrogated on all subjects connected with the society except the art of healing. 6. To cure the sick gratis. Sickness and healing seem to have been terms used metaphorically for ignorance and instruction or knowledge. 7. In all ways and places to oppose the aggressions and unmask the impositions of the Romish Church, the papacy. 8 to aid in the dissemination of truth and knowledge throughout all countries. 9. Writings, if carried about, were to be written in ambiguous language or in secret writing, query in cipher. 10. Rosicrucian works were, as a rule, not to be published under the real name of their author. Pseudonyms, mottos or initials, not the author's own, were to be adopted. 11. These feigned names and signatures were to be frequently changed. The Imperator to change his name not less frequently than once in ten years. Twelve, the places of publication for the secret writings to be also periodically changed. Thirteen, each member was to have at least one apprentice to succeed him and to take over his work, by which means the secret writings could be passed down from one hand to another until the time was ripe for their disclosure. Fourteen, the brethren must suffer any punishment even to death itself, sooner than disclose the secrets specially confided to them. 15. They must apply themselves to making friends with the powerful and the learned of all countries. 16. They must strive to become rich, not for the sake of money itself, for they must spend it broadcast for the good of others, but for the sake of the advantages afforded by wealth and position for pushing forward the beneficent objects of the society. 17. They were to promote the building of fair houses for the advancement of learning and for the relief of sickness, distress, age, or poverty. 18. When a Rosicrucian died, he was to be quietly and unostentatiously buried. His grave was either to be left without a tombstone, or if his friends chose to erect a monument in his honor, the inscription upon it was to be ambiguous. It is needless to show what an engine such a society would be, driven by such a motive power as Bacon, one original mind, endowed in almost equally balanced proportions with every intellectual faculty, equally capable of the quick perception of ideas, as of their prompt acquisition and application to useful purposes. With all this, Bacon possessed the still rarer faculty of being able to communicate his ideas, to impress them upon the dull, dead minds of the many, as well as upon the more receptive apprehensions of the few. Where opposition to direct teaching or advance in any kind of knowledge existed, there his versatile genius, the nimbleness of mind of which he was conscious, enabled him to devise methods to let new light in upon the understanding and conquer prejudice without raising contests, animosities, opposition or disturbance, to speak truth with a laughing face. We are disposed to shrink from the facts which stare us in the face and to say, is it possible that one man can have dared and accomplished so much? Is it possible that any one brain could have been capable enough, any life long enough, to enable one man to have not only planned but carried through the amount of works of infinitely varied kinds in which we find Bacon engaged? Is it possible that he could have found time to read, 
cogitate, write and publish this enormous quantity of valuable works, each preeminent in its own way, to have filled some of them with elaborate ciphers, and to have made many of them means of conveying information secret as well as ostensible. With all this, can we conceive him also experimenting to the extent which we know he did in every branch of natural philosophy, breaking a gap into every fresh matter, noting deficiencies in old studies and setting to work to supply them, in each case originating and inaugurating new ideas, a very different affair from merely imitating or following where another has gone before. In truth, a hasty judgment would pronounce these things to be impossible and contrary to common sense. But this merely means unparalleled in the speaker's experience. No other man has ever been known to perform such work as we claim for Francis Bacon. But Bacon was no ordinary man. He was an intellectual giant, born into a world which seemed to him to be chiefly peopled with pygmies. The spiritual and intellectual life of the world stunted, deformed, diseased, and sick unto death through ignorance and the sins which ignorance nourishes and strengthens. With his Herculean powers and eagle-sighted faculties of imagination, keen to perceive, subtle to devise, prompt to act, skillful in practical details, what might he not do with four pensioned, able pens continually at his command? And 63 of the choicest scholars of the universities to assist in the more mechanical parts of the work, to transcribe, collate and reduce into orderly form the collections, historical, scientific, ethical or phraseological, which during his life were to stand for him and for them in the place of modern books of reference, and which after his death were to be published as histories, dictionaries, collections, etc., under the names of those who were the ostensible editors or producers of works which they would have been incapable of originating. Whilst these men were thus writing under his eye, or according to his prescripts, Bacon himself, in the quiet of his library or tower, sometimes in his full poor cell in Gray's Inn, was cogitating, note-taking, dreaming, experimenting, composing, or inventing. Out of self-drawing Webby gives us note, the force of his own merit makes his way, a gift that heaven gives for him. The credibility of such assumptions is increased when we endeavor to realize how things would stand with ourselves if, from our earliest childhood, everything that we had lisped had been noticeable. If our earliest writings had been worthy of preservation, if every letter, every word we wrote had been religiously stored, revised, and by and by published. I add, but I never alter. That seems to have been part of Bacon's method, and thus, edition after edition, each time improved and augmented was produced. The same material being utilized in various ways over and over again. Bacon was never idle. Recreation with him was not idleness, but merely a change of occupation. He never plodded upon books, but read, taking notes or perhaps marking extracts for others to write out. Thus he wasted no moment of time, nor allowed one drop of his freshly distilled knowledge to evaporate or be lost, but carefully treasured and stored it up in vases or notebooks, where he could at any moment draw it out afresh. There is good reason for thinking that he largely encouraged the use of stenography or shorthand writing, that his friends sat round him as the disciples of the ancient philosophers sat round their masters, listening to his words, and often writing down his utterances or his entire discourses. The facility with which he expressed himself, the grace and sweetness of his language, and the marvelous fullness of his conversation were perpetual themes of admiration and wonder. His meals, says Dr. Rawley, were reflections of the ear as well as of the stomach, like the nodes Attica, or convivia deepus sophistarum, wherein a man might be refreshed in his mind and understanding, no less than in his body. And I have known some of no mean parts that have professed to make use of their notebooks when they have risen from table. Both the matter and the manner of John Selden's table talk assure us that this and several other similar books are merely transcripts of such hasty notes of words which dropped from Bacon's lips, reproduced as accurately as possible, and treasured up for the benefit of posterity by his loving friends. To look a little into the rules of the Rosycross Brethren, Bacon's Sons of Science, and of whom we believe him to have been the Imperator, or Supreme Head. 
Rules 1, 13, and 15 help us to grasp the possibility of Bacon's having produced the enormous quantity of books which will surely in the future ages be claimed for him and which can be proved by all that has hitherto passed as conclusive evidence with regard to other works to be the work of one author. Rules 2, 10, 11, 12, and 14 suffice to answer the oft-repeated query, why did not Bacon acknowledge his own works? Or why did not his friends vindicate his claim to them? He, as well as his friends, had sworn solemnly to keep the secrets of the society for a period of 100 years. Rules 3, 10, and 11 enable us to reconcile many difficulties as to the authorship of certain works. For instance, in the anthology entitled England's Helicon, there are poems which have, at different times, borne two, three, or even four different signatures. If the Rosicrucian publications were not, as a rule, to bear the name of the author, and if the feigned names of the brethren were to be frequently changed, confusion and mystification as to the true author would inevitably be produced. It would be impossible to draw any irrefutable conclusions as to the date and sometimes as to the aim of the works in question, and this doubtless was precisely what the secret society desired. Rules 8 and 13, especially when taken together with the preceding, throw great light on the publication of such works as Montaigne's Essays in France, of its supposed translation in 1603, from French into pure Baconian English by the Italian Florio, tutor to the English royal family, and of the large additions and alterations such as none but the author could have presumed to make in the later edition published by Cotton in 1685 and 6. Rule 8 seems also to explain the fact of many of Bacon's most intimate friends having passed so much of their time abroad. In days when to travel was a distinction, but not an everyday occurrence, and when indeed it required the royal sanction to leave the country. So Anthony Bacon lived for many years in Italy and the south of France, very little being absolutely known about his proceedings. Mr. Doyley, Bacon's first recorded correspondent, was at Paris when he received a mysterious letter explaining something in an ambiguous manner. Bacon's answer is equally misty. He studiously avoids particulars and means to be intelligible only to the person he's addressing. This Mr. Doyley had traveled with Anthony Bacon and after residing in Paris, went to Flanders where he was of long time dependent on Mr. Norris. What his business was is unknown. He returned to England in 1583 the letter from Mr. Doyley to Francis Bacon shows great intimacy. It begins, To my very dear friend, Mr. Doyley. Then there was Anthony Bacon's very intimate friend, Nicholas Faunt, at one time Walsingham's secretary, a gentleman attached to the Puritan party. From 1580 to 1582, we had him traveling with no ostensible object through France and Germany, spending seven months between Geneva and the north of Italy back to Paris and home to London in 1582. He is described as an able intelligencer and is just such a man as we should expect to find Bacon making good use of. The young Earl of Rutland receives in 1595 a license to pass over the seas. And although they pass for a while as the writing of Essex, it is Bacon who writes for him those letters of advice which were published anonymously nearly 50 years later. Then we find another of his most intimate friends, Toby Matthew, abroad, wandering and sometimes perhaps rather mysteriously occupied. Although, to Bacon's deep regret, he joined the Roman branch of the church, the correspondence and intimacy between the two never ceases. And we think that it will transpire that Sir Toby, having become a priest in the Jesuit college at Douai, continued to serve Bacon in many ways by aiding in the translation and dissemination of his works and especially in the production of the Douai Bible. The proceedings and writings of other travelers and writers or supposed authors of Bacon's time should be examined and reviewed in this connection. They are too numerous to speak of here, but we would remind the reader of his lifelong friends, the Sidneys, Herberts, Nevilles, Howards, Careys, Sandys, Cottons, of Lord Arundel, Sothos, Bodley, Camden, and the Shirleys, of John Selden, his trusted friend and one of his executors, Sir Henry Wotton, his cousin, of Sir Walter Raleigh, whom during his imprisonment he is known to have visited in the tower whilst he was engaged in writing the history of the world, of Ben Jonson, who, according to Drummond of Hawthornden, wrote from under Bacon's roof, of Sir Kenelm Digby, Montaigne, Florio Davies, 
and other foreigners, as well as Englishmen, whose names and works are found to be so curiously interwoven with the lives and writings of Anthony and Francis Bacon. By and by, we shall have to return to the subject of Bacon's friends and collaborators, and to the light which is let in upon their agency through the large collection of Anthony Bacon's correspondence, preserved in the library at Lambeth Palace. To return to the Rosicrucian ordinances, Rule 5 shows that the incognito maintained by the brethren was to extend, not merely to their names and authorships, but also to their knowledge and menial acquirements. The very fact of their belonging to a secret society was to be concealed. They were to pass through the world as ordinary members of society, wearing the dress of the country in which they lived, and doing nothing to draw upon them the special notice of others. They were even to conceal any special or superior knowledge which they might have acquired, actually professing ignorance when interrogated, the only science of which they were allowed to show any knowledge being the science of healing. Perhaps this is to be taken partly in its literal sense, and the rule may have been made with the benevolent intention of encouraging the study of medicine and surgery, which Bacon found to be terribly deficient. Also, this permission would enable the experts in these subjects to come to the rescue on emergency and to help to alleviate the bodily sufferings of their fellow creatures. Still, a comparison of the Rosicrucian works obliges us to see that it was to remedy the deformities of the age, to heal the sores and cankers of miserable souls, to minister to the mind diseased, that the Rosy Cross brethren were really laboring. And this fifth rule gives a good hint as to the reason why Bacon did not profess to be a poet, why Burton should not profess to be a theologian, or Montaigne profess to be a philosopher. The thought arises, what could be the object of this rule? Even if it were desirable for the safety of the author of dangerous or advanced publications that his name should be concealed, what reason could there be for obliging the man himself to feign ignorance of subjects which he had specially studied, and this too in days when the revival of learning was a subject of discussion and pride, and when to be supposed learned was a feather in a man's cap? There seems to be only one really satisfactory explanation of this and other rules, namely that the so-called authors were not the true authors of the books which passed under their names, that at the best they were translators, revisers or editors, often mere transcribers and media for publication. Under these circumstances it would not only have been false had they claimed the authorship of works which they did not write, but it would have been fatal and foolish in the extreme had they gone about professing to talk of matters which they did not understand. Rosicrucians were to heal the sick, gratis. This seems to mean that their work was throughout to be a labor of love. Not for the sake of profit or of fame did they labor, but simply for the love of God and of man created in God's image. Truly we believe that for this end, the brothers Anthony and Francis lived poor for many years, flinging into the common fund for publishing, etc., every penny which they could spare after defraying the most necessary expenses for themselves and to keep up appearances. We equally believe that their work has never died out, but has been taken up in the same spirit by numberless individuals and societies, now in full activity and recently mightily on the increase. Rule 17 would account for the extraordinary impetus given in Bacon's time to the building and endowing of libraries, schools, colleges, hospitals, almshouses, theaters, etc. The names of many such fair houses munificently endowed, will rise to the minds of all who are well acquainted with London and the two great universities. Let the reader inquire into the history of Gresham College, Sion College, and the splendid library attached to it. Dulwich College, with its school, almshouses, and library, originally intended to benefit poor actors, the Bancroft Hospital and many other similar establishments, the library and other buildings at Trinity College, Cambridge, the additions to the Bodleian Library, Oxford, the Library at Lambeth Palace, and the great printing houses established at both universities, he will find that we can never get away from Bacon and his friends. Either we find Bacon suggesting the need or encouraging the performers, or inspecting and approving the work, but himself, as a rule, unrecognized in public documents, so with the societies. His portrait alone hangs in the great library of the Royal Society, his friends are all closely associated with the founding of the Arundel Society, the Society of Antiquaries, the Camden Society, the Ray Society, and we think with the colleges of surgeons and physicians, 
But, as usual, although the names appear in connection with these and other institutions of his intimate friends, Bacon, the great instigator and promoter of them all, remains in the background. It is sufficient to read of such institutions that their origin is veiled or obscure for us to feel tolerably well assured that behind the veil is Francis Bacon. In Rosicrucian books not included amongst the short pieces in manuscript published by Mr. Waite, it is shown that one great work of the society was the publication and dissemination of Bibles. There are, says Bacon, two books of God, the book of the Bible, expressing his will and the book of nature, setting forth his works. Also, this permission would enable the experts in these subjects to come to the rescue on emergency and to help to alleviate the bodily sufferings of their fellow creatures. Neither can be fully understood or interpreted without the other, and men should be made equally acquainted with either. The Revised Bibles of 1591, 1611, and 1613 bear witness to his personal efforts in this direction. The commentary published at Geneva by John Diodati, the messenger given by God, or the messenger of God's gift, which Bacon says was the gift of reason with speech, should be examined in connection with this part of the subject. It will surely transpire that Francis Bacon played no minor part in promoting the knowledge of God's first book, and that his faithful followers have nobly fulfilled their vows and duty of carrying on his great work. For the second book of God, it is easier at once to make plain the enormous services which he rendered. He founded the Royal Society. In these words, we sum up the fact that he planned and set going the vast machinery which has produced such wonderful results upon science and upon almost every department of human knowledge. The history of the origin of the Royal Society, which according to its chief chroniclers is, like so many other matters connected with Bacon, veiled in obscurity, appears to be this. A few choice spirits met first in Bacon's private room, then at various places in Oxford and Cambridge, until the friends formed themselves into a small philosophical society under Dr. Wilkins in Wadham College. Meetings were sometimes held in taverns. When too large for these, they adjourned to the parlor of Gresham College. Lord Arundel offered the Royal Society an asylum in his own palace, when the most fierce and merciless of the elements subverted her first abodes, all of which is printed with many italics and very large type in the dedication to the illustrious Henry Howard, Earl of Norfolk. At the beginning of a curious little book, written in French by Roland Freyart, Sieur de Cambrai, and rendered English by John Evelyn, Fellow of the Royal Society. Evelyn obtained a charter for the Society from Charles II and named it the Royal Society. The rare literary accumulations of the noble family of the Howards were contributed to the library. The rules which forbid the publication of names would, of course, prohibit the Rosicrucians from writing their names in books, which were likely to reveal the course of their studies or their connection with a certain clique of persons, and so, in effect, we find. They must adopt feigned initials or mottos in order to identify themselves amongst their initiated friends alone. This again explains the disfigurement which so often distresses the purchaser of good old books of a certain class, and which is caused by the cutting out of large pieces of the title pages, or frontispieces or fly leaves, or the cancelling by scribbling with pen and ink sometimes six or eight names on the page. It is the exception and not the rule in books professedly Rosicrucian and previous to the 18th century to find in them the name of any owner, although they may apparently have passed through many hands. The same circumstance explains the mystery as to the disappearance of Bacon's library, which is a mystery, although the world has been content to take it very apathetically. Bacon's library must have been something quite remarkable for his day. Like Prospero, we know that his books were dearer to him far than state or public life, which was always a toil and burden to his nature. Being so reputed in dignity and for the liberal arts, without a parallel, those being all my study, I to my state grew stranger, being transported and wrapped in secret studies. Prospero in his fall and banishment is represented as most highly commending the kindness of the noble Gonzalo, who of his gentleness, knowing I loved my books, he furnished me from my own library with volumes that I prize above my dukedom. Without trespassing on the domain of the novelist, we may fairly believe that Bacon's feelings were the same. 
even if he did not actually experience a similar episode in the days of his cruel ruination and banishment from the home of his youth. Where is Bacon's library? Undoubtedly the books exist and are traceable. We should expect them to be recognizable by marginal notes, yet these notes, whether in pencil or in ink, may have been effaced. If annotated, Bacon and his friends would not wish his books to attract public attention. Yet not only their intrinsic worth, but their priceless value as belonging to their beloved master would have made the friends and followers of Bacon more than commonly anxious to ensure the safety of these books. Bacon himself, we feel sure, would have taken steps to this end, yet it is observable that in neither of his wills, elaborate and detailed in particulars though they be, does he mention his library. Copies of all his writings, fair bound, were to be placed in the King's Library, and in the university libraries at Cambridge and Oxford, in Trinity College, Cambridge, and Bennett College, where my father was bred, and in the libraries of Lambeth and Eton. The manuscripts in his cabinets, boxes, and presses, think of the quantity of papers suggested by these words, were to be taken possession of by three trustees, Constable, Selden, and Herbert, and to be by them perused and by degrees published, but of books there is not a word. An observation has led the present writer to the conclusion that during his life, Bacon assigned his books to certain of his friends for life or for use, and that eventually these books were to find their way into the great libraries where they now repose and where future research will oblige them to yield up their secret and to say what hand first turned their pages, whose eyes first mined into them to extract the precious ore so long buried beneath the dust of oblivion. Where in what books? Do we find this gold of knowledge, seven times tried in the crucible of poetic philosophy, cast into living lines, and hammered upon the muse's anvil into the well-tuned and true-filed lines which are not of an age but for all time? We earnestly exhort young and able scholars whose lives lie before them to follow up this subject. Think of the new worlds of knowledge that remain to be explored and conquered. Who can tell the contents of the library at Eton in which Bacon took such a lively interest? Who has ever thoroughly examined the hordes of manuscripts of Bacon's time at Lambeth Palace, at the Record Office at Dulwich, or at the British Museum? Baconians reading with modern searchlights rather than by the dim rays shed from even the best lamp of the last century cannot fail in future to perceive many things which escape the notice of previous observers, however diligent. The Selden and Pembroke collections of books at the Bodleian Library, the Cotton Library at the British Museum, the libraries of the Royal Society, the antiquaries, and others directly connected with Bacon, the theological library at Sion College, Gresham College, the collection of Bacon's works in the University Library, Cambridge, and at Trinity College should be examined, and every collection, public or private, which was commenced or much enlarged between 1580 and 1680, should be most thoroughly ransacked with a special eye to records, direct and indirect, of the working of Bacon and his friends and with a view to tracing his books. It is probable that the latter will seldom or never be found to bear his name or signature. Rather, we should expect, in accordance with Rosicrucian rules, that no name, but only a motto, an enigmatic inscription, or the initials of the title by which he passed amongst the brethren, would be found in these books. Yet it may reasonably be anticipated that some at least are noted in the margin or that some will be found with traces of marks which were guides to the transcriber or amanuensis as to the portions which were to be copied for future use in Bacon's collections or Book of Commonplaces. One word more before quitting these rules of the Rosicrucians. The 18th rule shows that on the death of a brother, nothing should be done which should reveal his connection with the fraternity. His tomb was to be either without epitaph or the inscription must be ambiguous. It is remarkable how many of the tombs of Bacon's friends and of the distinguished names of his time come under one or the other of these descriptions. Some of these will be noticed in their proper place. Meanwhile, let us remark that there seems to be only one satisfactory way of accounting for this apparently unnecessary rule. The explanation is of the same kind as that given with regard to Rule 5, which prohibits the members of the society from professing a knowledge which they did not possess. For suppose that the friends of deceased Rosicrucians had inscribed upon their tombs epitaphs claiming for them the authorship of works which had passed current as their writings, but which they did not really originate. 
The monuments would, in many cases, have been found guilty doing positive dishonor, not only to the sacred place in which they were erected, but even to the dead whose memory they were to preserve. For they would actually declare and perpetuate untruths, or at the best half-truths, certain in the end to be discovered. It is rare to find any epitaph by way of eulogium over the grave of any person who seems to have collaborated with Bacon, or to have been accredited with the authorship of any work which is suspiciously Baconian. Rarer still do we find on such tombs any hint that the so-called poet or philosopher ever wrote anything. In the few cases where this is asserted or suggested, there are reasons for believing or actual proof that the inscription, perhaps the monument itself, was put up by descendants or admirers some years after the death of the individual to whom the memorial was erected. Thank you for watching and please don't forget to share, like, subscribe and comment. And if you can, please consider donating to Wars of the Roses. Links to PayPal and Patreon are in the description. Thank you so very much.